when I was contacted for this presentation, they asked, would you talk about uh, developments in equipment? And of course, I agreed, but I changed my mind. So in fact, we will be talking more about developments in the process rather than the equipment. Uh, I, I do not want to stand in front of you and simply boast about uh, Ross Camp Champion, CPM, making the best equipment in the world, because you all know that already, <laughs> or you will learn. Uh, but we do want to talk about what's happening in the processes, because uh, things change. Uh, two weeks ago, I was visiting a customer site talking about uh, developments that we'd seen, changes that we've seen, uh, and I, I began to discuss a particular series of events that I had observed in about 1983 or 1984, and many members of the audience began laughing. And I couldn't understand at first what was funny until I discovered many of them had not been born yet in 1983 or 1984. So we, even in the relatively short career that, that Hector and I have enjoyed in the oilseed processing industry, we have seen changes, we are seeing changes, and so uh, we all need to be uh, equipped and prepared, realize some of the things that are occurring today, but also anticipate that in, in three years or five years or 10 years time, uh, the, the targets, the goals, the objectives in the industry may be uh, very different than where we are today. But let's begin. So uh, I have before you an example of rapeseed or canola. And we say, in theory, when the material arrives into your processing plant, you should see beautiful, clean seed. Okay. In fact, in practice, what arrives will contain foreign materials, bits of chaff. Uh, it is really not, in fact, that clean seed that, that we were anticipating, perhaps you were hoping for. The same thing in, in soya. We anticipate, we expect clean seed to arrive in our facility. But more and more, because of the demands uh, at, at the level of the farmer, uh, producing more seed uh, per unit area, more bushels per acre in North America, more tons per hectare in the rest of the world. The, the demands are there to produce more, uh, to harvest faster so that they can take advantage of the ideal conditions at, at harvest time. And so we end up with a lot of foreign material in the seed as it is harvested. And of course, most of that is delivered to your processing facilities. Okay. So let's, let's focus initially on improved seed cleaning. And Marcelo has just completed uh, a, a good session on screening and emphasized, again, a number of important points about selecting uh, the proper screening equipment. Uh, he really didn't go into maintaining, but maintaining that equipment so that you continue to enjoy that level of performance is very important. Okay? So we have, uh, at, the, at the receiving cleaning, we really have two objectives. Number one, get rid of the gross oversized materials, uh, the dead cats and rats, and in fact, he even had a dead parrot in, in a sample of seed, and you, you may chuckle, and yet, as we travel around the world, this is exactly the kind of thing that you will encounter. Uh, we also would like to remove some of the lighter fractions, get rid of the fines, get rid of the dust, get rid of the chaff, um, uh, already removing some of the hulls and, and other um, light components that may be included in the seed when they arrive in our facilities. Okay? It's also very important to remove any sort of ferrous materials, any iron-bearing materials. Those are relatively easy to separate with magnets, uh, but the magnets need to be the proper design, and the magnets will need regular attention 
in order to maintain that, that peak efficiency. Why should you clean the seed? Well, number one, whatever you remove, 1%, 2%, 5%, means you have that much additional storage capacity in your facility, and it costs you nothing. It's only removing foreign material that doesn't belong there anyway. Okay? Anything that we remove, we remove at the front end of the process means less contamination, less damage, less wear throughout the entire uh, rest of the process. And it is important uh, for today's high production facilities that you can count on the equipment to maintain that optimal efficiency day in, day out for 330, 340, 350 days a year. And the only way we can do that is by minimizing the wear that takes place uh, and we can uh, benefit ourselves to that end by getting rid of foreign materials that would otherwise cause wear and damage uh, through the processing equipment. It's also an energy saver. Again, if we can remove one, two, five percent of the foreign material before we put it into the process, even before we put it into the drying section, we will save a, a significant amount of, of money by not paying to heat those foreign materials as they move through the drying section. Okay. Uh, wrong button again. Okay. Also, by removing that foreign material, we reduce the risk of a fire through the drying stages at the front end of the process. And if you are a soybean processor and you operate a conventional front end dehulling plant that incorporates a grain dryer, uh, I, I don't have to point out to you that probably the biggest uh, single danger operating your plant day in and day out is the cleanliness of the dryer and maintaining uh, good product flow, minimum contamination, and avoiding the risk of the fire that, that would occur otherwise in the grain drying equipment. Okay. Anything that we remove up front means I have that much more room in the process for capacity. So good cleaning at the front end of the process means that, that I will increase the capacity of the plant, I will reduce wear and housekeeping, and overall at the end of the day, I end up with better finished product. Okay? And, and I'm going to tell you a, a short story about two plants in Argentina. I will not name them. You may be able to figure them out. Uh, both plants have the ability to process more than 10,000 tons a day. Uh, Ten years ago, one customer said, we process more than 10,000 tons a day. We cannot afford to clean the material. So everything goes into the process. The other customer says, we do more than 10,000 tons a day. We cannot afford to operate our plant without good cleaning and removing all of that product at the front end. Both plants are successful today. One plant has changed their philosophy. <laughs> All right, so here we have a, a, a typical flow sheet for seed cleaning at receiving. This is intended to be high capacity. Uh, we are increasingly seeing the use of rotary scalpers. Sorry, Marcelo. But uh, the rotary scalper is an ideal device for a very high capacity scalping operation. It is not a grading cleaner. It does not do anything for the fines content, but it is uh, extremely efficient at, at removing the gross oversized materials. Uh, in this machine, the screen is cylindrical and the screen is actually rotating. So the device is also relatively self-cleaning, very low maintenance input, low energy, uh, highly efficient at uh, removing the gross oversized material. Follow that, uh, in this case, uh, shown as a rotary magnet. Rotary magnets are very nice because they are continuously self-cleaning. No requirement for uh, periodic service to make sure that that magnet is working at premium efficiency 
removing all of the, the, the ferrous, the iron-bearing materials. Following that, we can then go through an appropriate uh, grading screener. Okay. Marcelo, I, I do uh, ask for due credit at this point. Okay. Illustrating the, the Rotex, the Megatex screener that has the ability to put a lot of screening capacity in a relatively small footprint. Okay. And then the uh, final step will be aspiration in order to remove any of the, the low density materials before they ever enter the process. Uh, and since Alan Ost is also in the crowd, I'll, I will uh, give a shout out to Crown. This is a, a typical uh, illustration of the Crown type aspirator, a counter current device where the product is, is moving vertically down, the aspiration airflow is moving up and works very efficiently at carrying uh, the light product out even when we have some particles stuck to the soybean hull, the action through that aspirator is very effective at, at making a separation, allowing the light material to be exhausted, the heavier uh, particles onto the process. Okay. What are the downsides of improving the cleaning in your plant? Well, obviously, up front, you, have to, you may have to buy some additional equipment. So you need to find a place to put the screening equipment. You need uh, the structure in order to house this part of the process. And there will be some additional uh, operating input. Somebody needs to look at, check on, follow up on this equipment, and ultimately some maintenance is required. Okay. Potentially, there is also uh, some lost revenue because some of the materials that you separate in a cleaning operation will undoubtedly be um, high oil or high protein that really needs to be going through the process. So there are potential losses uh, as you improve the cleaning part of the operation. I already mentioned space requirements. You need to find a place to, to put it. At the end of the day, you need to make your own analysis. You, you need to consider how much foreign material is entering our process stream? How is that impacting the drying, the storage, the processing, the quality of our final products? And, and make your own determination uh, to what level do you need to look at and consider improving cleaning of the material before it ever even enters into the process. As noted, uh, some of the material that we separate uh, particularly in the soybean business, will be pods that may contain soybeans. And you simply cannot afford to take that product stream and discharge it uh, as a waste stream. So we have seen uh, a number of plants in places around the world put in dedicated pod soybean recovery systems where the, the soybean will enter go through uh, the impactor, essentially a modified low-speed hammer mill to open the pod and, and separate the soybeans. Okay. Uh, screening operation in order to make a size separation and uh, frequently an aspirating stage in order to allow the, the soybean fraction, the whole bean fraction, to pass, removing any hulls or uh, fragments of the pods. The, the larger and heavier particles could also be passed through a destoner because some of the foreign material in that stream will undoubtedly be stones or mud balls or other uh, sorts of foreign contamination and we want to separate those products before we put the seed into the process. Okay. I noted the impactor, uh, simply a, a low-speed hammer mill, particularly designed uh, to be effective at opening the pods, releasing that soybean without uh, any significant or sub substantial damage to the soybean that would ultimately produce losses of 
the oil and protein if we create a lot of fines at that stage of the operation. These are soybeans recovered uh, after the impactor process. Uh, you can see some of the, the, the product stream here. This was fairly representative of the, the hulls or the, the pods and the pods containing beans. So all of this material was removed in a screening operation at the front end of the process. This entire product stream passes through the impactor. The pods are opened up, the soybeans are recovered, and the pods and other trash can then go on for further processing and, and elimination from the plant. Okay. Uh, we'll, we'll talk for just a moment about uh, the cracking stage of the operation, the next step in the soybean process. D depending on, on your plant, on your market, you, you may have different uh, purposes, objectives, goals, and standards for the finished products through the cracking stage of the operation. In most of the world, uh, to some degree, hull separation is important, okay? More or less important depending on where you are and, and what your markets are, but we, we need to crack the soybeans in order to achieve a level of hull separation. Uh, primarily, customers are interested in, in the fiber content in the meal, but also looking at the levels of hull fat uh, and protein in the hull stream because anything that was in the soybean that we're giving away uh, in, the, in the hull stream becomes lost revenue. That, that's product that, that is being wasted. Uh, in the cracking portion of the operation, we also need to consider what is going to take place next. Uh, particularly plants that, that uh, use the conventional process. Cracking the soybean at ambient temperature separating the hulls, and then taking uh, the meat portion of the soybean to a conditioner, we need to, to be uh, aware of the restraints, the constraints on the conditioner itself. Some plants with an undersized conditioner will require that we make the soybean cracks smaller than ideal simply to be able to get them heated all the way through so that we can do uh, an efficient job in the flaking portion of the operation. Uh, the bottom line, if you will, the, the, the ultimate uh, objective in, in the first stage of the soybean process is to crack the soybean, reduce particle size, get the hull separated, and make the cracking rolls last as long as possible. If we can obtain a, a, an adequate life span, a, an adequate a production period from the cracking rolls, Ultimately, we will lower the total cost to, to operate that entire preparation system. Okay. So what's new in cracking mills? Well, I could say vibratory feeders, but that was when we started in the industry, and so that's not new technology anymore. That's, in fact, uh, I think around the world we have seen vibratory feeders have run their course and they're gone. Uh, no new plants are, are utilizing the vibratory feeders uh, high initial cost, high maintenance cost, and unreliable operation. So we've, we've learned the lesson there. Those are gone. Uh, when, when we started supplying equipment in Argentina, beginning around 1995 or 1996, uh, roll feeders for cracking mills and flaking mills was, was the typical solution and remain a good solution today. However, the roll feeder is somewhat difficult to automate. And as the plants get bigger and you have more and more machines, the ability to automate units so that we reduce operator inputs is, is increasingly important. And as a result of that, we are seeing uh, the rotary pocket feeders becoming more and more popular for the cracking mill because it's uh, extremely easy to automate, simply utilize uh, variable frequency drive, that gives us the ability to stop and start the feed and infinite control over feed rate. Okay. The other developments that we have seen 
uh, in the cracking side of the operation are really uh, primarily focused on the rolled metallurgy, the rolled materials that are there. Okay, I've, I've made Thorsten's day because he, can, he, he now has something more to talk about later on this afternoon when he's, when he's telling you about roll technology. But uh, originally, we were all supplying chilled iron rolls. Uh, K00 is a description from one supplier, Balaguer. OCC would be a typical chilled iron roll uh, manufactured by uh, Walson Irla fr from Germany. Chilled iron rolls are very attractive because they are uh, competitively priced, relatively low cost. Um, they are a consumable item. And de depending uh, precisely on your facility, uh, how many tons per day you're processing, how, how far over the rated capacity of the machines you're actually operating day to day. Uh, the, the rolls may last uh, through only uh, two or three or four years. So the rolls are going to have a relatively short lifespan. You use them, you use them up, and, and away they go. There has been some interest in higher alloy, harder rolls to extend the period between recorrugation uh, of the cracking rolls. Uh, again, various suppliers, K12 uh, designation is from Balaguer. The OCE 600 rolls would come from Irla. They are a harder roll. They do allow you to, to run more tons before the rolls need to be uh, removed for recorrugation. It will require some extra work with your uh, vendor supplying the recorrugation service because they, they do not recorrugate the same way that uh, the standard chill rolls do. They are harder, they are more difficult to process. Again, at the end of the day, you'll need to make your own cost analysis. Is the potential benefit plus side, the longer life of the corrugation, going to be worth the added cost uh, and the added uh, effort required through working with your corrugator to, to keep those rolls in top condition. The traditional approach to cracking rolls uh, years ago were cracking rolls turning at relatively low speeds, uh, low differential rates, relatively fine corrugations making small cracks. Again, uh, if we look historically at the process, flaking rolls were smaller, uh, frequently 500 and 600 millimeter diameter flaking rolls. You had to make a relatively small crack size simply to allow uh, those flaking rolls to be able to, to make a purchase, get that material pulled in, and be able to produce a flake. Uh, the dehulling systems in the early plants were, were not very well developed and not very efficient. And again, in order to provide good separation of the hulls, we needed to make relatively small crack sizes. Today, the technology has changed. Cracking rolls work at higher speeds. Uh, 15, 18, uh, even 20 meters per second is not uh, unheard of for the peripheral speed on the cracking rolls in order to put as much capacity as possible in a given footprint. Okay. We're seeing a trend towards higher differential because it does yield a more uh, consistent crack size with better hull separation and particularly the plants that are doing warm dehulling or hot dehulling need a higher differential ratio in order to achieve uh, an effective hull separation. Coarser corrugations work very well with the higher speeds and the higher differentials in providing a longer service interval before the rolls need to be removed for recorrugation. And the industry is, is trending towards a larger crack size because, again, it, it reduces the amount of fines generated at that stage of the operation, which means less oil and less protein material being lost to the hull stream at the end of the day, that means you have a higher yield through the plant and uh, more dollars in your pocket at the end of the day. I do want to point out that in, in the cracking mill, ultimately the life of the cracking roll is determined by how many tons it processes, not 
by the roll speeds. And there is, there is some uh, misunderstanding of that, that a, a cracking roll that, that is working at, at uh, 15 or 18 meters per second has a shorter roll life than a cracking mill with rolls operating at 11 meters per second. On the one hand, that's true. You will change the rolls more frequently. On the other hand, uh, it's not true because the, the rolls will process the same number of tons. The, the biggest cracking mill that we make today uh, with rolls uh, roughly 400 millimeter diameter, 2.2 meters long, has the ability to process 1,500 tons a day and will do 150,000 tons before the rolls require recorrugation. Uh, we could run the same machine at 1,000 tons per day and operate uh, again for 150,000 tons, but now it's going to take us 150 days, uh, almost six months before the rolls require recorrugation. Uh, looks attractive, but you're giving up the throughput. You're, you're giving up performance of the plant. Ultimately, on the cracking roll, the life of the roll is determined how many tons you're processing and not specifically on the, the speed that the rolls are turning. Uh, the purpose of this slide oops, is, is just to give you a, a rough idea of what happens as equipment gets bigger. As the machine size increases, the energy consumption does go up, the equipment cost goes up. However, the service intervals will increase and the capital cost for the machines capital cost per ton goes down. So if we can supply uh, the big machine with the ability to do 1,500 tons per day, the, the installed cost per ton is lower, the connected power per ton is lower, the specific energy consumption per ton is lower, and the maintenance cost per ton are lower. There, there's an economy of scale in utilizing the bigger machines. Okay. What are they? Well, lower cost uh, for, the, for the total installation, more capacity in a given footprint. This is very important. Real estate is expensive. So the more crushing capacity that we can put in a smaller footprint, uh, the more efficient ultimately the plant will be. Lower operating cost. This is really important. As, as your plants, uh, particularly in Argentina, are doing uh, 6,000, 8,000, 10,000 tons per day, you, you simply cannot manage 20 cracking mills in order to, to do 10,000 tons a day. So the ability to put more capacity in a footprint means we can now do a 10,000 ton per day plant with, with seven machines, which is easier to manage, uh, easier to operate, and ultimately is, is lower cost. Okay. Um, however, as the machines get bigger and each individual piece is doing more tons per day, you need to do a better job of managing because when you stop one unit for service, it has a much uh, more significant impact on the total production through the facility. All right, move on to the flaking side of it. Uh, I don't have to worry about going over time because I, I have a good relationship with the next speaker and he said it would be okay. Because the next speaker is me. <laughs> okay, so flaking. Flaking is really the most critical part of the preparation plant that, that will allow you to either achieve good results in the extraction plant or prevent you from achieving those good results in the extraction plant. The point of flaking is to take that, that crack, reduce the flake thickness so that we have adequate surface area for the solvent to penetrate, reduce the distance that the solvent has to go, and in the process, rupture some cell walls so that the solvent can get in, dissolve the oil, and get back out again. The, the number one hindrance to achieving good performance through the flaking mills on a day in and day out basis is the fact that the flaking rolls wear. 
and the flaking rolls will not wear uniformly. The wear is always uh, concentrated more in the middle than it is at the ends, which creates a tremendous uh, management challenge for you, but creates a good business opportunity for companies like my own and, and uh, Balaguer and Walls and Irla that are supplying you the rolls. So, you know, you have to look at the positives as well as the negative side. Uh, ideal flake thickness will vary somewhat depending on your process. For the shallow bed extractors, those that, that have uh, the, the length to the depth ratio somewhere up around 50 to 1, we generally need to have a thinner flake. Uh, and 0 0.3, 0 0.35 millimeters is, is typically considered to be the thinner flake. For the deep bed type extractors, wrong button again, where, where the, the length to depth ratio is, is maybe in the vicinity of 20 to 1, will benefit from uh, physically thicker flake and generally a smaller flake. So if you have a deep bed extractor, it's typically necessary to crack the soybean to a smaller particle size. Uh, you have an advantage of, of being able to make a slightly thicker flake in order to create uh, material that will work more efficiently as the solvent percolates through that extractor bed. Okay. Again, we have uh, machines getting bigger. The largest flaking mills today with rolls over 800 millimeters diameter, 2.2 something uh, meters long, with the ability to do 500 tons per day soybean flake to 0.33 millimeters. Okay. That means we can put more uh, crushing capacity in a given plant at a lower cost, fewer machines to operate and maintain, so it's, it's more efficient. Okay. But once again, maintenance uh, and, and management of the operation need to be good because when you stop one machine, it, it may take a significant production of the production stream out. Um, Without naming names, one particular facility uh, in Brazil doing 3,000 tons per day on six flaking mills. If you stop one flaking mill, you lose 17% of the total production capacity. So you need to be able to manage and schedule uh, appropriately to, to get the best performance from that facility uh, every day, all day. Okay. Uh, we won't spend a lot of time on rapeseed canola, but the, the rapeseed process, canola process, is really dependent on what happens at the press. Uh, the, the press configuration will determine what, what we need to do through the flaking part of the operation. And so, uh, well, if you have more questions about canola, we'll, we'll be around uh, the rest of the day and tomorrow we'll do our best to, to deal with those uh, as they occur. Okay. Once again, the economics, uh, bigger machines cost less to install, cost less to operate, uh, re require less maintenance and operator input, but ultimately do require better management of the total process because when you stop a machine, uh, you, you take a, a, a bigger piece of production capacity away. Okay. And uh, finally, we'll talk just a little bit about roll materials. Uh, this is a, a more specific development of in the industry. Uh, again, I have been involved in oilseed processing for, uh, let's, let's just say, more than 30 years. And, and that, that's, that's close enough. Over that time, we have seen uh, developments in terms of raw material, we have seen uh, concepts uh, come in, and we have seen some that ultimately have, have gone out. Today, as it was 30 years ago, there are, are basically two general categories of flaking roll available. Indefinite chill rolls, which tend to be a little bit softer, more resilient, uh, better able to withstand certain levels of abuse, at the processing plant, or we have uh, chilled iron rolls. 
Chilled iron rolls have been around uh, probably as long as the industry. Very definite, distinct, hard chill surface. They do tend to be uh, harder, uh, which means they will wear longer. They're lower cost. But when you have a problem, if you have a problem with a chilled iron roll, the net result is a spalling failure where the material is broken and, and leaves forever. Uh, and, and so spalling failures can have a, a much more significant consequence on the performance of your plant. What we are seeing as a supplier is that, that our customer base is becoming extremely polarized. Customers that have had a good experience with indefinite uh, and frequently called softer roles will tend to favor those and, and will uh, defend them and are willing to pay a premium in order to have uh, the indefinite chill roll material because of its uh, endurance, the ability to withstand uh, certain amounts of abuse. Uh, other customers, other processing plants favor the chilled iron rolls. They are harder, potentially with a longer uh, life uh, that they can deliver in your process. However, if a chilled iron roll experiences a failure, it's generally a very significant consequence to your plant because that roll is broken and, and may actually have to be replaced. You may not be able to enjoy uh, the, the other benefits, the long life, uh, the, the lower cost uh, if the roll is broken before its lifespan is ended. It all comes down to good management. Uh, there, there is not one material that's better than another. There's not necessarily one supplier that's better than another. I'm ducking the stones that are about to come. Uh, ultimately, it comes down to you at your plant level managing your resources well. Any of the raw materials will be able to provide you with good service if you do your job well. And as a supplier, we need to provide you with the, the education and information you need in order to obtain those kinds of results. Uh, the next few slides simply talk about the, the technology of roll manufacture. Maybe Thorsten will, will uh, expound on that uh, when he does his presentation. So we, we won't spend time on that. I do want to finish up with a little bit on meal processing. Okay. Meal processing is not the same around the world. In fact, in, in North America, our customers, our meal market is almost exclusively high protein meal that is minimum 47.5% protein and maximum 3.5% fiber. Customers will pay a premium for that quality meal. In fact, they demand that quality of meal. And most of the time, it needs to meet a certain particle size analysis as well. 95% less than 10 mesh, 95% less than two millimeter particle size is the trading spec for the meal and what most customers demand and expect from the soybean meal that, that comes to them from the processing plant. Increasingly in North America, the concern today is for meal density because meal is shipped by rail and because rail transportation has become much more expensive in the last uh, seven to 10 years, Many customers, uh, Marcelo, forgive me, but will eliminate screening beforehand, grind 100% of the meal stream, grind it smaller than is necessary to make the trading specs, simply to obtain high density meal so that they can ship it more efficiently from uh, the plant on, in the Midwest or the East Coast to locations in the West where a lot of the meal is consumed. In the rest of the world, the meal market is quite different. Uh, it generally uh, will be a mid-protein level, 45, 46% protein, and almost always significantly coarser particle size requirements for the finished product. The same meal process, processing techniques that we utilize in North America really don't apply to the rest of the world. You, you need a product that will be low dust, low fines. Uh, shipping 
Cost is less important because you're loading on uh, ocean-going vessels, so meal density and, and capacity is, is no longer such an issue. Even fiber content is generally a lower concern for plants outside of North America because the meal is not being traded on high protein and, and low fiber. Uh, we do see uh, in China in particular that plants require the use of expanders so that the meal at the tail end of the process will be coarse enough that it can satisfy those customer requirements. It really has nothing to do with the quality of the meal. It has nothing to do uh, with the nutritional characteristics of the meal. It simply has uh, the Chinese market expecting a certain particle size, and if the meal doesn't look like that, it is not acceptable. So plants in China in particular uh, have to make a coarse finished meal, and most of them uh, are, in, are forced to use expanders just to produce the meal characteristic at the end of the line that, that their customers uh, will find acceptable. You know, how do we affect the meal process? If you're using hammer mills, there are things that, that we can do. Uh, lower diameter machines will yield lower tip speeds. Uh, utilizing six pole motors rather than four pole motors will lower the tip speed that will produce a, a, a coarser, more uniform meal with less fines and dust, which certain markets demand. Uh, and in North America, oops, we even find plants that are, are equipping the hammer mills with variable frequency drive, inverters, so that they can selectively produce a meal targeting a specific customer base or a specific customer requirements. And I'm finished with part one. Thank you very much.